and for questions, so don't worry, but you can also message um, so that you don't forget your question, which happens to me all the time. So it's better to write it down as we go. All right, so um, Dr. Doris Hill just put some questionnaires for you into the chat. Um, these questionnaires serve a couple different purposes. Um, some of them let us know what you already know about speech language therapy. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some surveys that will help us um, to know how we did in the presentation. Uh, did you find the presentation worthwhile and interesting? Um, and if you've been to one of our talks before, we do these surveys at the end every time and they're available in English, Spanish, and Korean. Um, and these go to our funder, uh, the Alabama Council on Developmental Disabilities. And they are the reason that we can bring you these amazing presenters and these um, language access services um, in Korean and in uh, Spanish. So the more they hear from the people who benefited from the services, the more likely we are to keep getting benefits and get the um, grant again so that we can keep providing these services to y'all. Um, also, don't feel like you have to only say good things. If there's something we could do better, um, please let us know that can go in the questionnaire or can be emailed directly to me, Maria or uh, Marie Gutierrez or Dr. Hill. Um, so uh, these benefit us uh, all around and help us to gain more funding for our presentations in the future. Quick introductions. I am Dr. Christine Drew. Um, I'm an assistant professor of special education at Auburn University. Um, and I do research on uh, challenging behavior in adolescents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I also do sexuality and relationship education for adolescents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I teach sex ed. Um, and I was lucky enough to get invited to work with Dr. Hill um, and Maria Gutierrez on this project. Um, Dr. Hill? Yes, hi everybody. Um, I'm Doris Hill and I'm the director of the Regional Autism Network and one of the primary investigators on this Hispanic Outreach Grant. And I did want to say the surveys that are in the chat right now are our surveys that Dr. Drew developed. And at the end, I will be putting in the survey monkey surveys, which are from the ACDD. And we really, that, that we really appreciate your feedback. Because again, as Dr. Drew said, it kind of gives them an idea of whether funding us was a good idea. And we actually got a second year of funding and we're crossing our fingers that maybe we'll get another one, but, um, but your feedback is important for that process. And next is Maria Gutierrez. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, thank you for taking time of your uh, Friday to, to join us in this um, great presentation. Uh, I know that sometimes parents have questions regarding speech, you know, and there might be some misunderstanding. So I'm sure that you guys are going to enjoy this presentation. I wanted to let you know that at the end of the presentation, sometime, you know, tonight or tomorrow, I will be sending a copy of the PowerPoint. Uh, we have it in English, Spanish, and Korean, plus the link of the recording for you to review it at your own pace if you have any other questions. So uh, thank you for being here. And now I'm going to pass the microphone to Ms. Kelsey Jones. Did we lose Ms. Jones? Oh, there she is. Oh, sorry, I was toggling back and forth between windows. All right. So, oh, goodness. Are we okay? It says my internet connection is unstable. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Kelsey. in 2016 from Auburn University um, with my master's uh, Bachelor of Science in Communication Disorders, also from Auburn. Um, I have five going on six years of experience as a speech language pathologist with monolingual and bilingual populations, um, so Spanish and English in schools, private practices, hospitals, nursing homes. Um, I've worked in Texas, Georgia, Massachusetts, and now Alabama, so I've worked all over the country. And um, right now I work at a private practice in Mobile, Alabama. So 
before we kind of jump into the uh, the the important part or the the meat of this presentation, I did want to reiterate um, what Dr. Drew said. Please send questions that you have walked in with um, as you think of them. If you have a question right now, I would love to go ahead and hear that um, because I want to make sure that those questions get answered. Um, and then as you have questions as we go, if you have questions about your kids specifically or about speech as a whole, bilingualism, any of that, um, please send them over as you think of them. And um, if I'm not able to answer them for you today, I will try to get information to Ms. Gutierrez and let her send it out to you in the email. So what is a speech language pathologist? Uh, sometimes we're called SLPs, sometimes we're called speech therapists, speech teachers. We have a lot of different names. Uh, we have a minimum of a master's degree and we have to maintain our certification nationally with ASHA, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association, and our state licensure also. So as I mentioned earlier, we can work in schools, hospitals, nursing homes, private clinics, and many, many more locations. Uh, we have five primary areas of focus um, that I'm going to tell y'all a little bit about now. There's speech disorders, language disorders, cognitive communication disorders, swallowing disorders, and then social and pragmatic language disorders. So our speech disorders are speech sound issues. So that would be if you have a child or even an adult friend that has a hard time saying one certain sound. Uh, for example, a child that can't say their L sound or their R sound. Um, we also have another class of speech sound disorders that's a little bit more rule-based, but so this is looking at how your mouth actually forms the sound, the sounds of a language. Also with fluency disorders, uh, which is what people commonly call a stutter. And then we also look at voice or resonance disorders, which would be that the structure or function of your neck and throat, or even of your mouth and nasal cavities, make your voice um, be either not efficient or sound atypical. Um, the next category is language disorders, and that could be um, receptive or expressive. So what you understand or what you're able to say, uh, these disorders can be spoken or written. And um, we look at lots of different areas of language. So we look at the form, which is the sounds, the words, and the grammar. Then we look at the vocabulary, which is the content or semantics, and then use, which is pragmatics. Um, and we're gonna get into that in this next category right here, which is social communication disorders. And so we see these um, sometimes in our, or often with our students with autism or other medical conditions like a traumatic brain injury or um, some other neurological, um, neurological issues. So that's difficulty with the social and it's the social use of verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, so if you think about the words that I'm saying to you right now is the verbal part of my communication. Nonverbal is my hand movement, my posture, my tone, my facial expression, where I'm looking in the room. Um, so those are all of the different areas that we look at there. And so all of these are used for social purposes, for changing the message, depending on the listener. Uh, for example, I talk, I'm talk. i talking very differently to you right now than I would be talking to a three-year-old um, or that I would be talking to my best friend. So we alter our message depending there. And then also the rules for conversation and storytelling. Um, how to tell a story that makes sense, that uses words like first, then, and last, uh, or uh, the rules of conversation with the give and take. One person can't be asking all the questions. That would be more like an interview. So that's we work, we work on these kinds of things a lot. And then the last two categories over here, we have cognitive communication disorders, um, which we see in our students with um, ADHD, with a stroke, traumatic brain injury, dementia, um, and then also some developmental disorders. So these would be um, problems with thought organization, paying attention, 
remembering, planning, or problem solving. Um, a word that we use to describe this category is executive functioning. And the best example that I can always think of of this would be that you're planning a wedding and you know that you have 100 people at the wedding and you only have 10 tables, but you have you know, Uncle Leo does not get along with Aunt Susan, but Aunt Susan has to sit beside Uncle George. And so figuring out how you can make all of these things work in this complex problem uh, is a great example of some, uh, something we would work on that, uh, for somebody that has a cognitive communication disorder. And then lastly, swallowing disorders. The medical term is dysphagia or dysphagia, depends on who you're talking to. And these are swallowing or feeding difficulties that can be from an illness, surgery, stroke, or injury. Um, but we also see sensory feeding disorders very often in our students with autism that have a particular um, texture of food that they love or don't love. Um, some of some only um, like to drink their calories or only eat crunchy foods, uh, frequent gagging with new textures, refusal to try things. Um, and that is something that a speech therapist and sometimes an occupational therapist um, can help with. I'm going to go ahead and um, answer a question that we just got because it's, it's sort of relevant to what we're working on talking about now. It's um, how can a speech therapist work on sensory issues or how can a parent address sensory issues at home? Um, I will say that occupational therapy uh, is one of is going to be one of your best resources with sensory issues, um, unless we're talking about feeding specifically. Um, and even then, um, the training that occupational therapists have is um, very extensive on sensory issues. And most of the things that I have learned has been because of treating with them, beside them, or being trained by them. Um, so, and sensory issues vary a lot from child to child. So um, if your child does have an occupational therapist, um, that would be a great, um, a great thing to talk to them about um, or ask your current speech therapist um, for some suggestions on how to target these sensory issues at home. Um, if you have any more specific questions about sensory issues, um, feel free to post those and I'll see if I can give you a little bit more detailed answer there. Okay, so now I want to clear up some words that we're going to hear thrown around a lot, especially, well, and specifically um, in the bilingual community. So first um, is the bilingual versus second language learner. Um, the common conception of bilingual is someone who speaks two languages equally. Um, but that is not necessarily the case, as I'm sure many of us know. Um, by, uh, by, by, bilingualism is a, um, is a spectrum, um, and it's a spectrum that has two languages. And so you can sort of think about it as two lines that can go back and forth like this. Um, some people are you know, equally proficient in both languages. Um, some have, have gaps in one language and another. Um, which is sort of where I fall in because I am a second language learner of Spanish. Um, no one in my family speaks Spanish. I learned in school uh, through living abroad and then also through my practice. Um, and so I have gaps in my Spanish. Um, I can talk about IEPs all day long. I can talk about um, early language development. Um, but if you ask me to talk about literature, I can't. Um, I don't. I don't have those words. So um, we will hear bilingual and second second language learners um, used as the same word, but really they do mean different things. So I might use them interchangeably also. Um, but if we can, if we say that bilingual is a spectrum, then um, to me that word makes makes plenty of sense as long as we all are understanding that. So then we also have simultaneous versus sequential language learning. Um, a simultaneous language learner is someone who grows up learning both languages or all three languages, all four at the same time. Um, I think the cutoff is considered before age two or three. 
a sequential language learner learns um, their home language first, and then the second language comes in later, or third or fourth, or whatever. And then we um, jump down to interference versus transfer. Um, these, these are two other words who, that are often used interchangeably, but um, interference to me has a negative spin on it because what, it's, what that word is implying is that the first language is negatively impacting the production of the second language. Um, the, the easiest example to understand there would be an accent that you speak your second language with the accent of your first language. Um, but from what we now, from what we know about language learning, um, the term transfer is more palatable to me um, because we consider that the first language influences the second language um, rather than a negatively impacts. So we expect the second language to be different um, than a native speaker um, because of the influence of the first language. And I'm gonna go into all of this in a lot more detail as we go. So just wanted to clear up some words before I started throwing them around. And then lastly is the difference versus disorder. And this is the number one most important thing, um, especially for professionals that are evaluating um, children who speak two languages or are bilingual children or trilingual or what have you. Um, like we just said with transfer, it is typical to have differences in your second language based on the first language that you speak. I, um, I speak Spanish with an accent because of my English. Um, when I try to speak French, I definitely speak French with an accent. Um, but that doesn't mean that I need speech therapy. That means that I have an accent. And so the important thing for therapists and teachers um, to remember is that those, we have to know what the, except what the common differences are versus what constitutes a disorder. Um, and we're gonna, like I said, go through that a little bit more as we go. Okay. Um, so there, bilingualism also kind of has uh, at its core an assumption of language proficiency. So I think if you hear someone say that they're bilingual, um, you will assume in your mind that they are um, proficient maybe equally or very similarly in both languages. Um, but there are two different measures. Um, there are two different measures of proficiency. We have the first one is basic interpersonal communication skills or BICS. And then the second is cognitive academic language proficiency or CALP. So the, the BICS language or the BICS proficiency is the language that's necessary for day-to-day -day living. Um, it's highly contextual. So you are talking about the thing that is right in front of you, um, asking questions about fruit at the grocery store, trying to decide what you want to eat for lunch, talking about the weather, talking about the sports game that's on the TV. Um, very, um, very uh, not abstract. It's, the, it's you're talking about what's right in front of you. So that typically um, with, with a... Um, with a heavy amount of exposure, it can be acquired in two years. Uh, so you think about the, the language proficiency that a typically developing two-year-old has in their native language. They're not talking about like highly abstract concepts, but they can, they can communicate pretty well about their day-to-day -day life. Um, then we trans transition over to CALP, the cognitive academic language proficiency. And these are, this is the language that's necessary to discuss concepts in the classroom. Um, understanding and discussing math concepts, word problems, taking standardized tests, reading and writing, um, interpreting a piece of literature. All, all of these are highly um, highly context reduced. They are more abstract. You're not talking about the piece of fruit that's right in front of your face. You're talking about this um, abstract math concept or um, the, the symbolism in a piece of writing. Um, and this requires five to seven years 
of exposure to a language. And, and this is consistent exposure, not you know, an hour a week. Um, so it's important to think about these two different areas because most likely if, if you are, um, if your child has been exposed to their second language once they enter school, um, they're gonna relatively quickly pick up these basic communication skills, the BICS skills. But it could take five to seven years of exposure um, to develop this cognitive academic language proficiency. Um, that's not to say that they won't or can't or shouldn't, um, but that's how um, that it's a reasonable amount of time for them to to um, to pick up those skills. And if any of you have tried to learn a second language as an adult, you can understand that it takes a lot of exposure to be able to talk about complex concepts um, unless you're unless you're completely entrenched in it all day long. And um, we just had a question uh, that I want to go ahead and get to. And if I don't answer your question in the moment, I will save it and ask and answer it at the end. I promise there's time built in. Um, so the question is, my child began speaking Spanish at home, but once he attended pre-K, he seems to understand more English. However, my spouse and I are not English speakers. Will he forget the Spanish? Um, and it says the sing language is English too. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he's singing in English in school. I'm not sure if you could clarify there. Um, so no. He's not going to forget the Spanish um, because you're going to be the one who's consistently in, um, exposing him to it. If you stop speaking Spanish to him, well, not only would you lose your means of communication with your child, um, but also he would he would stop having that exposure. So you can kind of think think about it like um, a plant that's growing. So his plant was growing very well, his Spanish plant, and then he started going to school and there's a new English plant in his garden. Um, and that English plant has been getting water, so it is going to grow. But if you continue to water his Spanish plant at home, that one's gonna continue to grow too. Um, and I am going to um, go into that a little bit more um, in, the, in the further slides. Okay, so before we can talk about what is abnormal, we have to understand what is normal. So the next couple of slides, we're gonna talk about what is typical, um, both in terms of language development in general and bilingualism. So we're gonna jump in here. Okay, so early language norms. Um, in typical language development, Children acquire their early language milestones at a similar rate and order in many languages. So English, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, to name a few. And that order is single words, word combinations, and then increasingly complex structures like questions, negatives, um, embedded clauses, so more complex sentences. And bilingual kids have roughly the same number of words at each stage as their single language peers, because we have to consider overlapping and unique words. So an example there would be, um, your child might have a word for apple in their home language and also in their second language. That is an overlapping word. They have apple in native language, apple in, the second language. Um, a unique word would be maybe um, maybe at home um, he's never been exposed to the concept of basketball, for example. So um, at home it's all baseball. And so he all of his baseball words are in Spanish or Korean because that is what you know, is talked about at home. Baseball is in home language, but basketball, all of his new words are being learned in English at school. So those would be unique words. So if we think about both languages, then um, then then the um, children have roughly the same number of words at each stage. And those kind of stages that we're looking for, 
is from 12 to 18 months. So one year to a year and a half, they're speaking their first words and they say two to six words other than mama and dada or whatever the equivalent is. So then by 18 to 24 months until right before they turn two uh, and at two, they're using 50 words and they can understand 150 to 200. So at this stage, you can tell them, go get your shoes and bring them to me. Or, um, or let's go to the park. And they understand that that's what's going. They're going to be walking towards the car. At 24 to 30 months, they're saying, so this is now two to two and a half. They're saying 200 to 300 words. And they're starting to combine words in early combinations. More cookie. Uh, mama go. More swing. Um, wear puppy. So, you know, simple early word combinations, mostly two words at a time. And then from two and a half to three, now we're seeing that they can say 450 words with more complex combinations. So they are consistently using this many words in their day-to-day -day speech. So the basic rule of thumb that we like to say is that at age one, they're saying one word at a time. At age two, they're saying two words at a time. And at age three, they're saying three plus words at a time. So I wanted to include this information here just so we can kind of see the difference in um, what age sounds are acquired um, in English and Spanish. Um, and um, for our Korean families here, I am, um, I do not, I'm not very familiar with the Korean language. And so I wanted to give you information about what I knew about, uh, but this information is easily transferable because I know that there are different sounds in both languages. And we're gonna get to that in a couple slides. So um, for example, by age four, we expect um, English speaking children is um, monolingual English speaking kids to um, accurately say the M sound N, H, W, B, and P um, in all words. They're not making any errors on those sounds. Those words are clear as day. So mama, um, nut, hop, or hot, water, um, bottle, and pillow. The P, all of those initial sounds would be accurate by age four. But if you look at what's expected at age four in Spanish, kids are correctly saying K, the K sound, L, W, the W sound, F, Y, uh, T, and N. So we expect kids to develop differently in each language because there are the sounds occur differently in each language. So if you're noticing that your child is, um, their speech doesn't sound like their peers, it could be because they haven't been exposed to the same number of sounds, or it could be because of transfer, like we talked about earlier. They could be speaking their second language with an accent. And here's just, an, here's another slide about the, um, the sounds in each language, which kind of helps to explain why, why do you speak your second language with an accent? Well, because there, there are different sounds in every language, some of which overlap, which you'll see in the center, but some of which are unique. Um, so the, um, the sounds that, are, that overlap, we expect kids to be able to say equally in both, language, in both languages. But for example, an English speaker that is learning Spanish has a very hard time with the, the glottal fricative, the h sound, uh, the hard back R, the, the trilling the tongue for an English speaker is incredibly challenging. Uh, and the same goes reversed. So we, we expect and understand that um, people will be speaking um, their second language with an accent. Reading through a question, just give me one second. Okay, I'm gonna to get to that one back at the end. 
And then, for example, here um, we can see um, this the Korean phonetic inventory. There are so many more. There are so many sounds that exist in Korean that don't exist in English, and vice versa. Um, so, just another example of um, of why we see an accent and how it's it's completely normal and nothing to be afraid of. Okay, so let's talk about some myths in second language learning. Okay, so these are these are some of the most common myths that we hear that if um, that kids will learn their second language, which is often English here in the United States, more slowly if their native language is spoken at home, uh, which we know from study after study is just not true. Um, and I will also, I'll say this a million times tonight, that if you look at the rest of the world, um, most people grow up bilingual, trilingual, speaking four languages at home, um, not to mention dialects. I have a family friend from Rwanda who um, spoke nine different dialects of his language and spoke them fluently, um, not to mention English. And they all sounded so different. You couldn't even tell he was speaking the same language. But that's but he he's a proficient speaker of, of at least 10 languages. And so that's that's the norm in most of the world. Um, the United States just seems to feel differently about this. So you do not need to worry about your child learning their second language slow, more slowly if the native language is spoken at home. Um, the reverse is actually often true that if the native language is supported well, um, that they will learn English more quickly also. Um, like the example I gave a minute ago about watering two plants in a garden that are together, um, you can't just water one plant. Um, language will grow as language will, language will grow, especially with little ones. Um, they are just sponges. They learn language so quickly. And then so number two, that kids should completely learn their first language before introducing the second language. Like the example above, it's just absolutely not true. Um, and if you look at um, how I'm sure many of you have been exposed to English, um, you, I can only imagine, like for me, I wish I had started speaking my second language earlier in life um, rather than waiting as long as I did. Because like I said, kids are sponges. They learn so well. Um, and, and the introduction of a second language is not going to cause a problem, a developmental delay um, with your child. Um, it, it just does not. So mixing the two, the third myth, mixing two languages in one sentence or conversation is a sign that they're confused. And this is one that just really gets me um, because we all do that all the time. Uh, so uh, we call it code switching. And there are different kinds of code switching. Some of it would be um, if I was sitting here having this presentation with you, or um, if I was in, let's say, um, a job interview, or or having a uh, giving a, a talk in front of a, a live group of people, and my child walked in the room, my whole register would change. I'd go from professional speaking voice to talking to my child which is a code switch. Um, it's the same thing when we switch between two languages. We do it for many reasons. It could be for emphasis. Uh, there could be that phrase, you're, you know, you're speaking your second language and you know, doing fine, but there's that one thing you can say um, in your native language that adds emphasis um, to show that you really are passionate about it or that um, it's particularly funny. Uh, so if anything, it's a sign of intelligence. Um, I, I have to do it all the time when I speak Spanish um, because well, one, I, there's, there are gaps in my vocabulary. Um, like I said earlier, I can talk about IEPs and language learning all day long in Spanish. Um, but if I have a parent ask me a question about my car, I don't have that vocabulary in Spanish. So of course I'm going to switch to where I know the vocabulary. Um, so not a sign of confusion, if anything, a sign of intelligence. 
And then um, to the question that we had a minute ago, parents who only speak their home language will not be able to raise a bilingual child. Um, my parents did raise a bilingual child um, and they don't speak Spanish beyond counting to four. And, um, but it's because I had other people that were watering that plant for me. Um, I had teachers and I had my host mom when I studied abroad and I've had all of my students and families that I've treated since I graduated um, that have been, you know, building up my Spanish skills. Um, and so, so you, your child is going to get plenty of exposure to English, but you might be their only link to their home language. And so there, that door would be closed um, to the culture, to the family stories, to the history, to, to deep communication with you um, if that home language isn't also supported. So also just not true. And then the last one, if a child seems to go through a silent period after language two is introduced, then they're going to forget their first language and not learn the second language. Um, and this is also just not true. Um, they, there's a, um, a period when especially younger kids are introduced to a second language where they are absorbing. They're not talking much. They are being completely immersed in their environment and taking it all in. Um, and as grownups, we have that happen to us sometimes, uh, you, because we're overwhelmed with whatever, um, that we have to take a step, you know, kind of in to ourselves and just we're observing, we're taking everything in. Um, so this is a completely normal, uh, step in second language development or third language development or however many languages there are. Okay, so now we get to talk about the fun stuff. Um, what are the advantages of being um, of being bilingual? And these are from um, many different health studies um, and also some some academic information. And so, number one is that there are many positive effects on the brain. Uh, it's been shown that bilinguals have a better attention span and are better at multitasking, um, which I can only. Uh, I can only agree with because when my brain is trying to speak two languages, especially switching back and forth, that's about the most exercise my brain ever gets. Um, then there's also an academic advantage. It's been shown that um, bilingual students are less distracted, more focused, and even have improved performance in their second language than their monolingual peers. Um, there's also economic advantages for bilingualism. Um, because of the way that our world is changing, we are increasingly reaching out uh, to other cultures and other communities. And um, so having the ability to speak two languages is enormously beneficial. There's also health benefits, delayed onset of dementia, improved stroke recovery, and lower stress levels, um, which if, if that's not a good reason to continue um, fostering bilingualism, I don't know what it is. Um, open-mindedness um, and social benefits, because um, odds are when you're exposed to a second language, you're also exposed to their culture. And we all know the power of being exposed to another culture and how it makes you a much more um, open-minded and easygoing person. And then you also have the ease of adding another language. Um, people who have learned a second language, it's much more easy, it's much more easy for them to learn a third or fourth or fifth or however many. And then lastly, like I've mentioned earlier, bilinguals are the majority in almost the whole world, except for here. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool group to belong to. Okay. So like we've, like I've been mentioning this whole time, we expect there to be differences in the second language um, of a bilingual or second language learning person or child because of transfer. Um, regardless of language proficiency, it doesn't matter how good language one was is and how good language two is, we're going to see that those two languages affect each other because they're not in two separate boxes in your brain. Um, language is stored in one place um, and we don't know exactly how those lines are drawn, um, but it's not two separate areas. So these differences can be word order, um, speech sound differences, which is known as an accent, 
word choice, or many other differences. Um, and they're normal. I want that, if there's one thing you remember, is that it is normal for a second language speaker to sound different than a monolingual person. Nothing atypical about that. But what if you um, see that maybe your child is demonstrating some differences that, that don't seem to fit in with the other people in your community? What are you gonna do then? So these are some of the things that we see um, as uh, red flags for maybe needing some, some support. Um, the first one would be that your child had difficulty learning both languages with support from you with the first language um, specifically and other caregivers. Um, and it, it, there's a mix there. So both languages are supported and they're having difficulty learning both. The next would be a family history of learning difficulties. Um, we don't know exactly how it's hereditary, but we do know that um, language learning or developmental um, delays or disorders do have a genetic component. Um, if your child is developing slower than their siblings, uh, you, you know, older sister didn't have any issues um, picking up Spanish and English as soon as she was exposed to English through you know, TV and then eventually through at school. Um, but your second child is seems to be moving a little bit more slowly. Um, if their speech sounds different than other people in your community, you just you hear that something just doesn't sound like everyone else that um, that also has the same language history. Um, then that's when we start to wonder, um, either because of the sounds or the construction of the language, their words or sentence structure. Um, if they have difficulty playing and talking with peers, so um, they have a hard time maybe sharing toys, or you find that they um, don't engage with other kids when you go to the park well, um, that's, a, that's a red flag. And then also difficulty with language and routines. Uh, humans are highly routine oriented people. Um, I'm sure all of you do the exact same things almost every single morning when you wake up. I do. Um, and I bet a lot of your kids do too, um, because you take them through those routines. So if you notice that they're having difficulties understanding the words that you use nearly every day to describe a routine, for example, um, okay, it's time to go get in the bath. And they're not making it evident that they need to go take a bath, um, that they need to walk to the bathroom, that's something that, um, that's, a, that's a warning sign for you there. Okay, so you've decided that you're worried. What now? So the first thing that you can do um, is call the school or write a note um, to their teacher saying that you're worried. Um, you know, I've noticed that, um, you know, you've, you've noticed that their speech doesn't sound like the rest of the kids in the area or that they're having a hard time, you know, telling you what they want or need um, and, and tell them that you're concerned. If they, if the school does not respond to your concerns, uh, you can always request an evaluation yourself. It is well with, it is within your rights as a parent, excuse me, to, um, to request an evaluation. And what I always recommend that parents do, I, I worked in school systems. And so I, I understand the process pretty well. Um, write a letter to the school formally requesting an evaluation for speech and language. Um, if you're also concerned about their academic performance, put that in there too. Um, sign and date the letter and save a copy of it for yourself. Um, just because, you know, it could get lost in a backpack. Um, it could get lost, you know, in the office. You'd want to make sure that you have evidence that you sent that letter in. And then if that doesn't work, um, you can call your school system's main office to get in touch with the special education department. Um, and see if you can get the ball rolling that way. Um, you can also ask their doctor about these differences. 
um, and see and, you know, communicate with the doctor that you're concerned about their miles, them meeting their milestones or that they're, you know, not developing like other kids that you've seen, or if they're an only child and you're concerned, their doctor's a great place to start. Um, and you can ask the doctor for a referral to a speech language pathologist, either in a private practice that you know of, um, or an outpatient clinic that's affiliated with a hospital. Okay, so at this point, um, I am going to take a time to go back and answer the questions that we have up to this point, and then we're going to move into kind of the more practical part of, um, of the night, and we're going to talk about how to promote language development at home, um, but, you know, please keep asking questions um, as, as you have them. Um, so I'm going to scroll back up and, and get some of these questions. Okay. So the first one was, should a special education teacher work on speech goals if there's no speech therapist at the school because she's on maternity leave? Uh, no, um, but that is hard to really complete, that's hard to completely answer out of context. Um, I know that there have been students that I have written goals um, purposefully to target with the special education teacher. Um, because they were with the teacher all day, every day, and they were only with me, you know, once or twice a week. And so we were working collaborative, collaboratively on all of the goals anyway. Um, so in that instance, then yes. Um, but I know that staffing is really hard right now. And so it doesn't really surprise me that there it maybe is a vacancy. Um, I think the question would be, are they planning on making up the services that they're missing once the once the speech therapist comes back? Um, because they definitely can't count that as services um, that he's that your child is getting. It's great that they're working on the goals. Go that teacher. Um, but yeah, my question would be: Are they going to make up services? And if you if you have any more questions about that, feel free to keep keep posting down. Okay, the next question, can an autistic child who's mostly nonverbal be best served in a general education classroom with an aide or paraprofessional assisting during certain periods of the day? Um, I would say that is highly dependent on the child. Um, I know a lot of completely non-speaking autistic um, children and or adults who, yeah, should definitely be in a general education classroom all day long because academically that's where they are. Um, they either have a talker that they use to communicate or a system that they have. Um, I think it's a question of, so the, the uh, terminology I guess you use is least restrictive environment. Um, and so we wanna think about how can the child um, access the curriculum with the most independence, with the least restrictions and support. Um, and that is something that your whole team needs to decide. Um, that would be you and the teacher and the special education teacher and the paraprofessional and the speech therapist and maybe the behavior team. It's a big team there um, that's making those decisions. So maybe, I guess is my answer to that question. That would be awesome. Okay. Okay, so this question, can you talk about how, can you talk about how to know when you need to seek out a feeding or swallowing evaluation? For example, you, you suspect your child has surpassed what we call picky eating, and we need an evaluation. The child is autistic, was diagnosed with feeding aversion, and has limited food. Um, so the feeding is, is not my specialty. Um, I work with a lot of wonderful therapists who are so good at it, and so I let them do what they're really good at. Um, so the kind of wording that we use is picky eating versus restricted eating or problem feeding. 
Um, lots of kids are picky, um, but if you have a child who's only eating maybe five foods and the only specific brands, like they only eat McDonald's chicken nuggets and they only eat McDonald's French fries and they only eat um, rainbow goldfish um, and no other variations of those foods, um, that definitely seems like it's a problem feeding instead of just picky eating. Uh, we we're towards restricted. Um, it would have to be an order from your physician. So the physician would have to place the order to get either a speech evaluation or an occupational therapy evaluation, depending on the services that are available in your area. Um, and generally those services are not provided in the school setting. Um, that would be done either at an outpatient clinic affiliated with a hospital or through a private practice. Um, so uh, how I kind of feel about it is if you have questions, it's always worthwhile to get the evaluation if it makes sense financially for your family. And then you can get some answers from the therapist um, specifically regarding your child. So when in doubt, evaluate. Um, and they can always tell you, you're, you know, you're doing, you're doing everything right come back in six months or come back in a year. Um, and yes. And if you have questions about how that would look financially for your family, um, you can call private practices in your area and provide them your insurance information, or you can call your insurance company and um, ask how they handle um, uh, um, speech therapy evaluations. Because uh, if a speech therapist is treating the feeding disorder uh, or the picky eating, then it is um, coded as regular speech therapy, um, which might make your insurance more happy. So, but that's something that you can work through with the practice that you're working with. Okay, so the next question is um, that she has a child that is three years, three months old, and she's noticed that he started to say a word like mama. And then three days later that, that he doesn't say it anymore. Um, and that he's not repeating it either. Um, and so he learns a new word and then he seems to kind of let it go and he doesn't retain it. Um, that they speak Spanish in their house. Um, all therapy is in English. And she wants to know if maybe this is the reason that he's not retaining the words. Um, probably not. Um, this does happen a lot with our young kids with autism. Um, they have a word for a little while and then they kind of let it go. Um, especially if we're talking about verbal responses. Um, but it's wonderful that he's trying. Um, that he is producing verbalizations that have clear meaning to you. Um, that's great. He's reaching out. He's trying to communicate. Um, my question would be, are they trying some sort of a talker or a picture exchange system? Because he's obviously trying to communicate with you. Um, and we will talk here in this next section about how to promote um, language development at home that can maybe help you um, with that communication. Thanks for the translation, Maria, I just saw it. Okay, um, so this next question is about selective mutism. And I have never treated a child with selective mutism. I've had some that I thought were at risk um, for maybe advancing to that stage. Um, but the question is, I've heard some children with autism have selective mutism, but I don't fully understand if this is related to a speech delay. Can you explain if these are related? Um, so this is a completely anecdotal and observational statement that I'm about to make uh, based on my treatment. Um, I have found recently that so many of my kids with autism um, are very anxious communicators. Um, they have a lot to say, but the, the concept of speaking verbally just is physically um, anxiety inducing for them. 
And when a speech generating device or a talker was introduced, now they won't be quiet. Um, they are talking all of the time, verbally and with their talker. Um, I have two kids, one who's oh, not of my own, two clients who um, one is like five or six and one is nine, just turned 10, both of which maybe spoke one or two words at a time before um, a, an AAC or a um, speech generating device was introduced. And now they are speaking three to four words verbally um, and eight, nine, 10, 11 words on their talker um, in mm, like six months. And so they are exceptions to the rule. Both of these kids um, had so much desire to communicate, couldn't get it out. So that would be my inclination about the selective mutism question is maybe it's anxiety related. And if you could provide another method of communication that wasn't verbal with their voice, um, then maybe that would help. Um, because what we see with so many kids with autism is you can tell that in there, they want to get out. It just can't. Um, either because of apraxia, because they have motor planning concerns with their mouth or this anxiety component or both. Um, so very circular answer, um, but I wouldn't say that it's probably related to a speech delay, at least not with what they understand. If you have more questions, please post them. Okay. Here's another one. So I seem to be the only one who understands the sounds and noises my child makes when he wants something. Any suggestions? Um, that is so common because you, um, you are probably anticipating a lot of their needs um, and you know them well enough to understand what they want um, either by their tone or by the time of day or um, by the situation that you're in. Um, you know, I mean, mamas learn how to interpret the cries of their infants. They know if they're hungry, they know if they're tired, they know if they're wet. Um, and so probably that is what is happening. Um, you have deciphered the meaning, um, in what your child is saying. And they, I think the question, he's three and a half years old. Um, so it's wonderful that he's communicating. Like I said earlier, he's reaching out. He's attempting to tell you what he wants and what he needs. Um, my recommendation would be to simply provide um, the, I will say this in big quotes, the real word um, that he is asking for. So for example, you know he wants um, juice, but his word doesn't sound anything like juice. Um, then you say, oh, juice? big, loud, animated, um, with the juice in your hand. So clearly, highly contextual, um, you are holding the cup. Oh, juice? And then you're reinforcing, you heard what he said, you understood what he said, um, and you're providing that good model back. Um, and if he's not in speech therapy, I'd highly recommend trying it um, because that's something we can most definitely help you with. I say we collectively as a field. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So this last question is what about those who chew or eat not edible items like crayons? How should the school address that? And is this something that can be worked on outside the school um, paying through insurance? I'm always concerned about the things my child has eaten that are not for eating. Um, I would definitely talk to your doctor um, and see if they're, um, and see if there is something medically, um, maybe that is the reason that the child is eating all of these things that they shouldn't eat. Um, Chewing though, if they're just chewing on things, um, 
they make these breakaway. Um, oh, heavens. Can I pull up my Amazon, Dr. Drew, and show them? Okay, I'm just going to show you a picture because I can't think of how to. Yeah, describe absolutely. This. And okay. the and I, if you're, if you are interested in what I think about the, eating, Please. I can also say a little bit about that. So, um, so the, as a, a BCBA, we talk about that as something called PICA, P-I-C-A, PICA. And so that's eating non-nutritive items. So it can be anything from the fluff off of your sweaters, you know, little bits of fabric to batteries, like really dangerous things. And so, um, there are um, ways the school can address that. And one of those ways is by having a functional behavior assessment completed by a team um, to figure out the why of that behavior. So is it that they're seeking sensory input, right? So the things that um, Ms. Jones is about to show us may help because maybe they're looking for, maybe their teeth are bothering them, right? So going to a doctor, going to a dentist to figure out is there something happening here um, sensory illness wise, right? Um, also, we also have behavioral reasons why someone may be doing this. So sensory, there are ways to meet that need. Um, keeping the, you know, if they have a favorite item they like to eat. So some kids are really into uh, Legos or, you know, small plastic figurines to eat. Um, so keeping the area clean of those things can be helpful and keeping a good eye on them. Um, also eating things that aren't food may be a good reason to have a one-on-one -on -one support in the classroom if that is what's necessary to keep them safe. Um, and But you might find that they're doing it for attention. You might find that they're doing it um, because they're hungry. You might find, you know, there could be other reasons. And so the team needs to, this is something that needs to be looked at as soon as possible, because this is a can be a very dangerous behavior um, for a lot, right? You can get sick if you're eating things off the floor, right? That's where the germs live, um, you know, or eating things other people have touched without gloves on. That's where the germs live. Um, and then also there are, there is the possibility of things getting stuck, things causing tears in the stomach lining, um, things becoming balled up in their stomach. Um, if they're eating things like hair, it can result in just like a cat, a hairball um, in their stomach. And that's called trichobezoar um, and it requires surgery. So it, it, it can be very dangerous. And I don't know if that's what's happening. Maybe your child is just eating lint and maybe I'm being dramatic. Um, but for everyone else, this is, that's a really dangerous behavior. And um, the team at school needs to be on top of that um, as soon as possible, including a speech therapist, including an occupational therapist, including a physical therapist, include, I mean, you need to get everybody on board. Everybody. So this is what I was gonna recommend. Um, my, my, my only caveat, um, is make sure it has a breakaway clasp. Um, these are little like silicone-y, um, let me pull actually one up, little silicone-y kind of necklaces. Um, and you see here that it has a breakaway clasp because you do not want it to get wrapped around your child's neck and, um, and choke. Um, so a lot of kids chew um, and I mean, there's a million different kinds of these, just make sure it's like non-toxic food grade. They might like a certain texture, whatever. Um, so the, a lot of reasons that, that kids will chew on stuff, um, you know, um, fingers, the butt of their hand, um, clothing, food, uh, toys always in the mouth. Um, there's a lot of soothing reflexes that happen or responses, um, that happen when we chew. Um, people love crunchy food because it feels good when we chew on stuff. People chew gum when they're stressed. Um, so chewing releases a lot of um, happy feelings. Um, so replacing the chewing with undesirable things with a desirable thing um, might be 
the ticket. Um, but that would be just like Dr. Drew said, something that your whole team could come up with um, what would be appropriate in the classroom also, um, and making sure that their necklace is not does not become a projectile um, because that definitely happens. <laughs> um, so I have some kids where we have to, we tie them so they're shorter um, so they can't, you know, spin them around as easily. Um, but the kids can figure out how to undo those clasps so easily. Um, so, you know, multifaceted, but I love, I love those two, um, those necklace things, all different shapes, like I said. Um, okay. So the next question is about programs like Gemini um, for kids on the spectrum. And I will be honest, I Googled it because I did not know what it was. Um, so it's what it seems like to me is, and Dr. Drew, you might know this a little bit better. It seems sort of like they're using like ABA techniques, um, but in previously videoed sessions instead of in-person therapy that you're paying for. Um, they use the words just discrete trial analysis. And so I'm, I'm guessing that it's a drill type thing. Um, so a lot of kids on the spectrum are completely obsessed with technology. So, you know, if you can use it to your advantage, I think that's always a benefit. Um, but having a, a specific program that your child is following based on your child, instead of like a large group of children that's been curated for um, would always be my recommendation, but I don't know anything specifically about the program. So I don't know that I can give you a great answer there. Um, I am happy to read up on it. I found they do have a research section on their, um, website. It looks like some people have done some things. Um, I am, I would have to do a little more, but it looks like they've done um, maybe research. Yeah, it's, it's mm, during week one, instructors showed the standard video model in half the classroom, discrete trial, two groups. So I'm happy to look into it. It looks like they have done some um, research, but it looks like it's mostly for teachers in the research. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm always a fan of, you know, it's great if there are resources for teachers, but what would be even greater is if they hired a BCBA who could come in and do the training directly because part of, just like an SLP, right? I can sit at a table and talk to a kid about their favorite toy. Like she's used examples before and that's great but I'm not gonna do it nearly as well. And when things go wrong, I don't know what to do, right? And so if we're using sort of this pre-made thing when things go wrong or when things aren't working, if you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, you can kind of get yourself in trouble. So I can look into that more though and kind of type up a little something yeah. about it. Um, happy to, but um, yeah, I had not heard of it either. No, I've been getting a lot of ads on my social media lately about like, there's the, there's a bunch of new apps that are supposed to be teaching kids to talk. Um, and I would just say like, beware of marketing um, because it works. <laughs> and, um, you know, if, if the, if your child, you know, if, if screen time is something that really works well in your household and you want to leverage that screen time towards academic style games um, or activities, I say go for it. Um, but is it really going to teach kids to talk? Probably not. Um, but we'll, we'll go over in just a second about a good way to kind of work on that at home. Uh, so here's a question. When is it recommended to request assistive technology to address the communication needs of a youth who has limited verbal abilities? He's 14, school still uses pictures, but I wonder if he could expand his knowledge if he uses technology instead. Um, it is never too early to try. Um, it, in the school system, oh, I'm sorry. I said, I read that really fast, Mr. Reed. Um, when is it recommended to request assistive technology to address the communication needs of a youth who has limited verbal abilities. He's 14 and the school still uses pictures. 
but I wonder if he could expand his knowledge if he uses technology instead. Um, so I don't think it's ever too early to try. If pictures are working really well, then odds are a higher tech system would also work very well. Um, and I mean, part of it depends on what, if we're talking about a, a child with autism, um, that's different maybe than, you know, a child with uh, cerebral palsy or something like that, but still it's never too soon. Um, school systems sometimes have a team that can do this. Um, sometimes it's easier to find a private practice. Um, that can do it outside of school, and then they can take that device into school with them. Um, that would depend on where you live and what resources you have around you. Uh, but no, I don't think it's ever it's ever too soon. So I guess when is it recommended? Now. I'm a big fan of trying. The worst thing that happens is it doesn't work, and you try something else. Okay, so. I'm going to move now into, um, mm, no, okay. I'm going to stay just here, my whole face on the screen, because um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how to promote language development at home. Um, because the best way to learn is through play, pretty much regardless of age. Um, and so, um, by observing what your um, what your child is interested in and leveraging that interest towards a communication opportunity, um, you are going to open a lot of doors um, for communication with your child. And so I have several different toys over here on my desk, and I'm going to sort of like demonstrate for you um, how I would play with each of the toys. And then I also remembered that um, I have some um, handouts that I already have translated into Spanish that I do provide for families, like um, discreetly explaining how, discreetly, uh, directly explaining how to play with different toys. Um, and so I can email those over, um, Maria, after to, to disseminate them. Um, they're very, very, like, very basic Spanish because you know, my writing is not ideal, um, but still you could judge them up and if you'd like. Um, so to kind of explain, because people take it for granted uh, that we know how to play, um, but playing is a skill that we learn. Um, and, and often are, especially with our, um, our students with autism, play doesn't progress like it does with, with a typically developing child. Um, a typically developing child goes through um, like playing side by side and then playing cooperatively and then playing pretend, like very basically, that's kind of how it progresses. And often our students with autism, they, they're not even comfortable with parallel play because they want their things how they want their things. Um, and so figuring out how we can uh, um, leverage their interest to, to keep them engaged in play, to hear all of that good language is half the battle. Um, so if you have a kid who's obsessed with cars, um, which so many of them are, it seems like regardless of age, um, a car track is one of my very favorite toys. I'm gonna back up the computer a little bit. Okay, give me a little bit more room here. So one of the reasons I love this car track um, is because it has doors down here where the cars are all stored. Um, because my, my favorite three words for an early language um, client are more, go, and open. You can do a whole lot with those three words and they use very early developing sounds across English and Spanish. Um, not sure about Korean, but um, they are highly contextual. It is very, very clear what go means. It is very, very clear what open means. We are, we see open, we can see go, and we can see more because we get the more thing in our hand. Um, so highly contextual, easy to say, easy to do. And they, they, it works for so many different things. Think of all the different ways that you could use more 
if that's the only words your kid had uh, in a day. So that's why I really, really love this car track. So um, what I would recommend if you have a kid that does have a hard time sharing toys um, because they want to play how they want to play all the time uh, and don't really want you looped into their play, there's three cars here. Um, one of them stays in my pocket with me. They don't really know it's there. And I get one and they get one. So we each have a tool, we each have a car. We're not feeling territorial about our cars. Um, and we play loudly. Uh, I work in a private practice with, let me think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven therapists, including myself, on my hallway. It sounds like we're at a rave during therapy sessions. It is loud. Um, we come home and can't talk at the end of the day because all we do is be very loud. So what, how I would play, how, okay, how a kid who doesn't really care about playing a whole lot would play with this toy is like this. Right, all day long, up, down, up, down, no words, no looking at anything. We're just super interested in watching our car go down the track, picking it up and putting it back. So me, how I would play with a kid with this toy is like this. <gasps> oh, look, we have car. <gasps> open, open, car in, close. <gasps> Knock, knock, knock. Oh, where's the car? Car open out. Okay, here we go. Ready, set, go. Oh, more. Are we going to do more car? You get the idea. Big, loud, and short. We're not talking sentences about this car especially for our kids who only say one word or maybe no words. Very short to the point, simple words. Um, the other reason that toys like this are great is because you can leverage routines, um, like verbal routines. So if I say, ready, set, what's the next word? Go, right? It's never gonna change. It's always going to be go. So we can leverage that expectation um, to where I say go at first. Ready, set, go. And maybe it, maybe they just look at me. Maybe it's, maybe it's like a glancing eye contact. And that's the trigger point. That means go. And then once they're consistently making eye contact, then we go, then we wait for maybe just a mouth movement, maybe just just little, or maybe they're saying go. So verbal routines, simple words, and maybe you can just pick one word. You're talking about other stuff while you're playing because you, you're gonna be here with the kid. So it's almost like you're, you're the perspective of the kid in this situation if I was playing with this, with this car track with a child. Um, so it's very engaged, even if the kid's not super engaged, that's still my level because they're listening. They're hearing all of that. Hmm. We just got a question about something else I've never heard of before. Okay, so pause. I saw a post where transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, was recommended for children and children start speaking within a month, but it's very expensive. What's your opinion? If this technology works, then I need to know. Um, but once again, I guess beware of advertising and marketing um, because that sounds a little too good to be true. Um, I would need to do some significant research before I could give you a good answer there. I was going to say, be careful if there's research associated with it, because sometimes the people who are trademark the product do the studies, and that's a conflict of interest. Yes. Thank you for that. I'm going to do a quick Google, so you go ahead, Ms. Jones. Okay, thank you. Um, 
team teamwork here. Um, so that's cars. Um, and the same thing transfers to so many other toys that we can play with, because um, when we when we're playing, we want to be um, narrating what we're doing using um, simple but highly powerful words. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the word. So if I'm going to talk about putting the car in, um, put isn't the most um isn't the most powerful word word in that sentence it's going to be car and in because we're looking at what we're talking about um if it was you know if the box was all the way over on the other side of the room and i was saying okay go put the car in that's that's pretty abstract for a kid who isn't communicating a ton um but if we said okay look car in highly contextual, very simple. Um, study after study has shown that, that, that the higher pitch and louder volume works really well for our language learning kids, um, regardless of if they're learning one language or two. Okay, so that's cars. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Jim. Ready for what I found? Yes, please. Um, so this is a, a, a reference from Autism Speaks, which I understand is a controversial organization. And so I do want to say that I understand not everyone agrees with Autism Speaks, but I thought this was a good breakdown. This is actually written by someone who researches this and it's from 2016. So it's a, long, it's a while ago and they may have updated the research, but basically at that point they said, uh, the researcher said they have done some research, but they've been very small studies and they haven't been uh, controlled, meaning that everybody got the same treatment and in a um, in the best way to do research, some people get the treatment and some people get something else or they get a fake treatment where they put the thing on your head and then they just don't run the current through your brain um, to see if it's um, really the thing that they're doing or if it's something else that's causing the change. So at, at that point, they said that it did not. Um, so I'm gonna put that in the chat. It's in English, sorry, but I think Google offers some translation things um, and I'll keep looking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so my other probably number one favorite toy um, is bubbles because they are so uh, versatile. Uh, highly recommend buying non-toxic bubbles. It's very easy to find them that are non-toxic because your child will put them in their mouth at some point, guaranteed. Um, they probably won't do it much more because they don't really taste that good. Um, so I love bubbles for the same words that we talked about earlier, more open go. Um, because those are just, those three words can get you a whole lot. And what we want kids to understand really, really early on in the speech therapy process is that their words have power. Um, they say something, they get something, um, which is why so many um, baby toys and, and toddler toys are cause and effect toys because they push a button on the toy and Mickey pops up. And so their action got an immediate result, which is the exact same thing that we want to happen with communication. We want our kids to understand that when they say something um, in a way that, you know, the majority of people can understand, um, they're going to get something for it. So we want to honor those attempts to communicate highly. Um, with that being said, um, that's why exclamatory words are so powerful. Whoa, beep, uh, crash, ow, uh-oh. All of those words, pop is another great one um, because it, it's an easy sound to make with your mouth. Um, P is a very early, early developing sound um, in many languages, um, especially like Latin um, based, sorry, especially Latin based languages. Um, and so the, the P is, is a great one. And so we can talk about pop bubbles. Um, the, the woo, wee, B, 
beep, beep, all of those words are great to weave into your play um, because they're also less pressure than real words. Uh, like we talked about earlier with our kids with autism that have that uh, anxiety regarding communication, all of the, all of those like silly words, like sort of comic booky words, um, don't have the same communication pressure as cracker or cookie or mama or whatever the word is. Um, so that's a great way to kind of start breaking through. So with bubbles, very similarly to the cars, yeah. try to not blow bubbles on, woo, try to not blow bubbles on my computer. Um, so, so the other great thing about bubbles, which I almost forgot, is that most little kids cannot open them. Uh, and I love that. I love, I love things that kids can't do without me because I want to be the source of fun and you should be the source of fun when you're playing with your kid. Um, if all of their toys are out like this, where they can just get to all of their toys all of the time, they don't need you and they don't need to communicate to get their toys either. Um, we love clear boxes, especially cheap ones, especially not cheap ones that don't open super easy, but some little still can't figure this out. They can see all the fun stuff, but they can't get to the fun stuff without me. Um, child locks on cabinets, also a great investment um, because you want to be the source of all fun. If they can get to all of their fun without you, especially while they're playing, or if you're playing with their favorite toy and they can just go get another one and avoid you, then, you know, it's easier just to have one thing down at a time. So bubbles they can't open and I sit them on the table in front of them. Like, okay, we have bubbles, hey bubbles. And then I kind of wait a little while and see what's gonna happen. Waiting is super powerful with kids because they're used to grownups talking at them all the time. And so I just sit it there and say, okay, let's do bubbles. And I wait and see what they're gonna do. And a lot of times they'll walk away. They're just like, well, she's boring. Um, but then I get to have fun with the bubbles all by myself. I get to pop them. I say, okay, I'm gonna open bubbles. Ready, set, go. And then I get to pop, pop, pop on my bubbles, especially when I only blow one. And then I get to pop, okay, close bubbles. All right, what are we gonna do? Are we going to do more bubbles? Um, also love baby sign um, for our early language learners. The It's pretty straightforward. So we have more for more. Um, open, you open your hands like a book. Um, and then go, there's lots of variations. A lot of people just do like a point or something like that. Um, so pairing the, all the different modalities of learning, they're physically seeing my mouth say more, they're hearing my mouth say more, they're seeing my movement of more, and then that more is immediately tied to more bubbles coming. So we're trying to get as many modalities of learning as we can. Um, same vein, I sing a lot to kids. Although some of my kids with autism really do not like me singing, so I don't sing to them as much. Um, but song is super powerful. If you think about all of the songs that you can sing right now, just like on the drop of the hat, you hear the song, you can sing it. Um, it, it taps into something in our brain and lets us remember stuff really easily. So all of those big repetitive songs are super great. Um, Old MacDonald, um, Wheels on the Bus, Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, uh, the Five Little Ducks song. And the great thing is, is so many of these now have been translated into different languages on YouTube. Um, so you can play the sound on YouTube and sing it together. Because probably if you have the video up on the screen, they're more interested in the video than they are in you. And so you can learn these songs to sing to them. Um, Okay, um, my, I have like two other great like toy recommendations. Um, I bought this set of wind up toys, I think really like four years ago, maybe um, on Amazon. And they're great little wind up toys. 
I love them because little hands can't turn them. Um, and they make, they not only make noise, but they move so much um, that they're really motivating for kids. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show you how it goes. Um, hmm, hold on, I gotta make space. You can see it a little, you can see it hop along. So we love these because we can do ready, set, and I have my hand on it, right? So like it's not moving, but to them, it's just magic. Ready, set, go, ah, go, oh no, go. Oh, Bunny's broken. Oh no, he's my favorite one. That's so sad. He's, yeah, he's had a long life. Um, but I love wind up toys. Uh, I think I paid maybe $11 for all of the, this whole box of them on, uh, on Amazon. And I think I've only had like three or four break. So really good investment. Great way to, to loop your kids into play um, and make you be necessary for play because they won't be able to do it by themselves. Um, puzzles are another great one. Um, I really like these peg puzzles because they're a lot easier for little hands and they have a clear spot where the thing goes. So it's great for like early matching and things like that. Um, I love to be really silly when I play with puzzles. It's my favorite way to work on yes and no questions because those are really hard for a lot of our kids to understand. Like, for example, like, is this a rooster? That's hard for kids. Yeah, it is a rooster. Um, so I like to do that with puzzles. Hold on, this is gonna be loud. Um, so I'll let them pick what they want. We'll say, okay, you want the dog? All right, let's get the dog. Is this the dog? No, dog. Okay, let's try again. Where is it? Okay, is this the dog? Yes, it is the dog. And so we're talking about it while we do it instead of just letting them, um, you know, kind of play with it by themselves. Everything is a tool that we can use um, for, for language and for, for stimulating language at home. All right, so I'm gonna jump back into my presentation. I have a couple more slides over there. Um, we have about 20 or 25 minutes left. Um, so please, you know, send over any more questions that you have, um, or if you have any follow-up questions from what I've already answered. Let me pull this back up. Okay, so we've already gone over a good bit of this information, um, what you can do to promote language development in the home, but I want to make sure that I touch, oh, and see, I forgot one. One of the most important things to remember is the plus one technique. So if your child is consistently saying one word at a time, um, they're communicating with that one word. Um, for example, they might say juice. And so when they say juice and you give them the juice, you can say, okay, you want more juice? One more word than they said. We're always taking it one step beyond where they are because we're wanting to, um, we're wanting to advance those skills. Um, next is the three to one rule. We ask, uh, grownups ask kids a lot of questions. Um, and especially for our students with autism, questions are very overwhelming. Um, and you're not going to get as much language as you would if you made a statement. For example, uh, you could say, what do you want for snack? And you might not get that in a single answer. But if you said, hmm, okay, it's snack time. I see that we have cookies and crackers and chips. Oh, we have so much good food for snack. You're much more likely to get, an, uh, to get a response from them with that type of um, offer rather than a question. Uh, I, I, I really think it goes back to the anxiety piece about communication. Questions are just hard. The next thing is verbal routines. So there's kind of two different areas we can talk about those routines. We can do ready, set, go, one, two, three. Um, I'm sure there's more, can't think of them right now. Or we can think about the verbal routines that we have around our daily routines in the home. 
um, for example, bath time, snack time, meal time, um, all of those are, uh, odds are they happen very similarly in your home nearly every day. And so you can, you can take advantage of all of this language that you have built in. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to sabotage these routines um, because it can really make kids think. So if you normally give them a whole, um, like a whole bag of goldfish for their snack, give them three um, and act like nothing's wrong. And you say, okay, here's your snack. And then they're gonna eat their three goldfish and think, okay, mom and dad have gone crazy. Um, where are my crackers? And it's a great opportunity for them to request more. Um, or if you normally fill the bathtub up and then put them in the bathtub, um, put them in the bathtub with no water and let them think, what, you know, we, we need something. And then, and let that be an opportunity for communication. Self-talk is another important one. Um, I call it narrating your, your child's life. Um, talk about what you're doing all the time while you're doing it, especially when it's highly contextual. When you're in the situation talking about it, when you're in the situation, talk about it. You're at the grocery store. Talk about all the different foods that you see. Um, if you're cooking dinner, talk about what you're doing. If you are... Um, folding clothes, talk about all the clothes that you're folding. Um, we want to really have our kids in a language rich environment. Communication temptations is a big one. It goes hand in hand with, with withholding, which I've already talked about a little bit. Um, the toys in clear boxes that they can't get in or on high shelves um, that they can't reach, containers that they can't open, um, snacks and bags that they can't open um, because it just, it, it begs for communication. And then repetitive books and songs um, are super powerful. Uh, one of my favorites, I think I talked about this last time, is, um, uh, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the series. It's all about Bear. Um, and my favorite one is Bear Wants More. And kids figure out so quickly um, that the the each page is going to end with but bear wants more it's a great way to work on um finishing those sentences and and using that good language to communicate oops there we go okay and i just realized too um that i didn't talk about play-doh and i would be highly remiss if i didn't because it is probably one of the most versatile toys um, because of action words. Um, a lot of our early talkers seem to um, focus primarily on nouns because they are very powerful. Um, the noun helps them get what they want, um, but verbs, um, verbs are just as important and they can be very, very powerful. So. Um, what I what I do with my Play-Doh is I have all of it um, here in a big bag and I have some like cheap grocery store uh, cookie cutters and a little bit rolling pin and there's like a skillet and a spatula and so we can talk about rolling, pushing, um, cutting. Of course, we can open Play-Doh because Play-Doh is really hard for little hands to open. Um, we can cook, we can pretend to eat, um, so many good verbs in this one little bag, um, that we might not get from other toys. So I'm going to, um, oh, we did have, we just had a question come in, um, asking for a copy of the presentation and, um, Maria, they get a copy, um, afterwards, correct? Okay, great. So yes, y'all will get a copy of the presentation in, um, English, Spanish, and Korean? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, that um, that is all the information that I had planned for tonight. Um, I can definitely keep going on some areas that we've touched, but if there are any more questions, I would love to answer your specific questions. I think those were all the questions that came through me. Um, I believe you already responded some of the ones that they were posted. Uh, so that, uh, I, I believe you already addressed them, unless okay. I missed one. 
Let me go all the way back. I was going to scroll back through too. Dr. Hill, could you drop the surveys in the chat box again, if you have them available? Yes. Yay. Thank you. She read my mind. Mm -hmm. Y'all work so well together. Please take the time to, um, to do the surveys because um, it means a whole lot to our funding and it gives us feedback. It lets the Alabama Council on Developmental Disabilities know what we're doing and specific feedback for us is very helpful to know where we should go in the future. Um, so please, please take the time. The ACDD one doesn't take that long. I'm not sure how long. And we do have that one in Korean, Spanish and English. So. And I'm going to put the other, the one I put in at the beginning of the presentation uh which is in spanish and english i'm going to put that in one more time also if there are any specific topics that you uh, think that we maybe should invite a speaker please let us know send us an email or just you know um give us a call and say hey you know have you wondered about uh having a presentation regarding this topic uh we are here to assist our families and we want to hear from you. I and on that note, um, next month on the 14th of, what is it, June? Yeah. <laughs> Already? 14 June and 17 June, we're doing, we're having presenters on aging and disabilities. So um, that, that was a suggestion that we had along the way that we should find someone to present on that. And um, so that will be our topic next month. And my last note is to say thank you to Ms. Jones. That that was, I haven't watched anybody play on Zoom before. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, talk we talk all the time in my practice that um, we really need like a video library um, mm -hmm. on YouTube that we can show parents how to play um, because we take it for granted that, that everyone knows or learns um, well when you do the ados the autism diagnostic observation schedule the the evaluation a lot of it is they call them presses but a lot of them is using toys and play skills um uh last note for me and i'll mute myself is i wanted to say thank you to miss do and miss park our korean interpreters and mr reed and miss baker as always we so appreciate your um your support and your wonderful interpretation skills. So um, we appreciate that. And on that note, I will mute myself. I do not see any other questions, uh, Kelsey. So I don't know if parents have any other questions. They would like to put it on the chat box or send them directly to you. Yeah, I'm happy to. And um, I know that um, something that we didn't really talk about is how um, it works having a monolingual therapist um, for a bilingual child. And um, my preference is that a lot, especially with younger kids, um, you know, maybe like three and four and younger, um, is that a lot of it is done as parent training um, because we want to continue to support the home language. And so if your kids are in therapy, um, you know, for speech or OT or PT, whatever it might be, um, ask if, you know, ask if parent training can be incorporated into their therapy sessions, um, because we want our, our number one goal as therapists is for, is for the kids and adults that we treat to no longer need us. Um, and if we are able to empower parents to do a lot of the language development at home, um, then sometimes we're not needed anymore because there's it's often that kids just need a push. Um, they need to be told how to, taught how to use their voice. And so ask um, ask to be you know ask to be allowed in the room um, if it's possible for your child and for the setup with of your therapist um, so that they can teach you uh, what to do um, to can to you know to support their needs at home. Um, Oh, we must, somebody must have gotten kicked out and went back in. Um, 
because you know the the analogy of the of watering the plants in the same garden um, works well. That you know you you can't really only water one plant. Um, they're both going to continue to grow, especially with our little ones. Um, but I think my number one recommendation would be to continue to support the home language really strongly um, because you know they're going to be getting a lot of English input at school um, unless you live in a community where you know there is bilingual instruction that's an option. Um, when I worked in when I worked in Texas, the I, I did work at a bilingual school, so kids had an equal exposure to English and Spanish up through third grade, and then it tipped to where um, English was higher in fourth and fifth grade. Um, but that is not the norm, especially here in Alabama. Um, thank you. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the, um, the feedback. Um, and I think um, Maria is going to send have my email address embedded in the YouTube video, um, and so if any of you um, are interested or or you know have any additional questions that you need to discuss, I'm happy to to maybe point you in the right direction if I don't know the answer. You want to put it in the chat real quick too? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, and there is you can search on. Um, on ASHA's website, it's hard to type and talk at the same time. Um, you can search on ASHA's website, which would be, I'll try to put that in, asha.org um, for bilingual therapists. Um, it's but it, at least bilingual speech therapists. Um, but um, we are self identified as bilingual. There isn't a measurement of that yet. Um, for, Did, oh, I sent it directly to Maria. That's what I was going to say. It looked like it went directly to somebody. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, it defaulted <laughs> there. Um, so we we do self-identify. Oh, no, that didn't work. Sorry, hold on. Technology is not cooperating with me. Now it's not working. I should have it again. There we go. And then shut down. Okay. Good deal. All right. Well, I I could probably keep rambling for nine more minutes, but I can't think of anything else offhand. Um, I just want to say thank you so very much, much, uh, Kelsey, for for your time and for uh, explaining it it's so simple for our families and professionals. Um, I just posted the link of the YouTube channel where we um, where we added the recorded the previous session. We'll be adding this one as well because I noticed that the questions were different. So uh, every presentation, you know, is unique, and uh, I think that this will be also um, something that uh, parents will appreciate and, and learn something new. You know, sometimes you have different questions on on the same you know, on, on the same topic. Um, so I would like to invite our parents and, and attendees to subscribe to the channel so that you get a notification when there is a new uh, video uploaded for you to review. Um, Dr. Drew, is there anything else, anything else that we would like to, that you would like to add, Dr. Drew, Dr. Hill? No, um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their Friday and a wonderful weekend. Once again, thank you, Kelsey, and uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our interpreters, and I hope that everybody gets to rest this weekend, and we'll see you next month. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.